This dude got a fucking 1975 eight track in his fucking hand. Let's ride. What's up, everybody? It's Soren Baker here on Unique Access, and today we are joined by the OG Scarface. Thank you for coming through, sir. Soren, what's good? Man, everything is good, face, especially cool. this artifact I have in my hands right here. It is a fucking. Of Dalen, that's an Dalen ancient. Was. That's an ancient artifact. It's it's. This is an album that Slink Johnson and I love this album. I love Slink. I just talked to Slink. Slink. Shout out Slink Johnson, a.k.a. Black Jesus. But, Face, the thing about this album that I thought was so amazing was the perspective that you took as a writer, as a storyteller and everything. And obviously, A Minute to Pray, Second to Die is, is one of the favorites by a lot of people, but Diary of a Madman. There's so many amazing songs on here. So when you were yeah. writing it and crafting it, how did you decide to examine looking at things and death in particular from such different ways than we'd heard in rap before? I don't know. It was totally not planned, okay. if that's the question. Was I planning to do that shit? Nah. I kind of put the pen to the pad, and that's how that shit came out. Okay. You know, um, I just wrote. I just wrote what the vibe was that day. I wrote what I felt that day. You know, I don't, here's the difference with me and, 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 and everybody else that goes into the studio to record an album. They go in the studio to record an album. You know what I mean? They, right. they only go in that motherfucker tomorrow and start recording and be done Thursday, Friday. All right? All right. I go in the studio when I feel like going in the studio. You know, when I got a, when I, when I got a gym, you know, I hear something, oh man, I'm gonna do this. Like, that's why it take me so long to make albums, because I don't sit in the fucking studio all day, all night, all week, all month, all year, doing the album. <clears throat> I do a song here and there, and feel the vibe of the motherfuckers, ride the vibe to them, man, and, and fix them. Go back and, you know, that's why it take me so long, because I want that shit to be absolutely perfect. You know, the delivery, the wordplay, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, it's got to be perfect. When so, doing this album right here, I was not, you know, in the studio every fucking day recording. I would make a beat. I, I did this album, too. I did beat production on this album, right. all but a couple of songs. But, um, you know, I'd make a beat, man. I'd ride in the car with, with my 215s, okay. beating the beat. That's why the beat sounds so motherfucking mean in there, yeah. Bottom. They got the bottom in it, and you can listen to that shit and tell I was heavily fucking influenced by both of the uh, uh, the East and the West Coast best producers at that time. Yeah, because you can you can hear kind of the well, you had the gumbo funk going on. No, that wasn't gumbo <laughs> funk back then. <laughs> it was a little head, just the precursor. Yeah, this was before uh, you know Joe. What? This was Molly Mall and Dre. But I do think though that was influenced there. Yeah, on that album, you to hear, me. But I think it laid the foundation for what the gumbo funk would be. Maybe so. I, I, yeah, 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 yeah. By yeah. blending the coast. So right. That's what I'm getting. The obviously Marlon Marlon New York and Dr. Dre West Coast influence, and you combined it in a way to me that laid the foundation for what would be the gumbo funk a few years later. In my opinion. I, when, when, when people say gumbo funk, I think about, you know, Joe. Yeah, yeah, okay. all right. So, when, yeah, I can't say that this was influenced by Joe or... Well, no, I'm saying it influenced what you guys did later, is what I'm saying. <clears throat> the combination of the sounds. Yeah, me and Joe fuck around and do some great shit. No doubt about it. Mm -hmm. And then, for that, like, what, in your opinion, did you take from Marley Marl and take from Dre that impacted this album specifically? I love Marley's... Um, off beat 808 kick patterns mm -hmm. and Dre the way he, he, that he could take a fucking song and, and, and change that motherfucker mm -hmm. and then bring the song back in he'd be like fuck <laughs> you know a perfect example was uh, 100 Miles and Running okay yeah that was a great EP great song <laughs> and, uh, unmatched now here's the thing about that, as we're talking about Mr. Scarface is back and your your overall career is that <coughs> NWA at that time and it changed dramatically uh, in a large degree with the chronic, but he had and you had with Born Killer, you had this urgency in the in the sonics of it. 
and 100 miles yeah. running has the urgency in the sonics. Yeah. But then a minute to pray, a second to die has the more meditative, somber thing. That the laid back, yeah. So with you, how do you find you're able to bring like the top tier lyricism and storytelling to such dramatically different sounds? I think you have to write what the beat is doing. Okay. You feel me? Like I feel like um, if that song is moving and it's in a certain pitch, and you have to move your voice to that tempo and, and your, your, your tone to that pitch of that song to match that motherfucker. Right. At least that's how I am with it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a vibe. It's the, the beat gives me a vibe, man. I'm not going to get on a beat that's, you know, 70 and rap 140. I'm not going to double time a 70 beat. I'm just gonna get in the pocket, find the pocket of that motherfucker and kill it. You know, like I'm a master at finding the pocket of the beat. And that, that being said, I wanted to get, um, before this album, obviously with Grip It On That Other Level and then the Ghetto Boys self-titled album, you guys made the songs and then they were remixed, had different beats, some had different yeah, lyrics. Yeah, 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 yeah. So how did, how did that process work as far as rewriting or revising the rhymes or keeping them the same on like Mind of a Lunatic and, and different songs? Um... I think that was a Rick Rubin, uh, James idea, okay. if I'm not mistaken. I think that when the Ghetto Boys got picked up by Geffen, mm -hmm. I think that Rick wanted to change some of that. And then I think Jukebox wrote that. Uh, uh, it may have been Willie. It may have been Willie. She begged me not to kill her. I gave her a rose. Then slit her throat and watched her shake till her eyes closed. Had sex with that was Willie. Had sex with the course before I left her, and, and wrote my name on the wall like hell. That was Willie with that. Crazy. He wrote that. <laughs> Willie wrote that shit. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Fucking right. Hmm. That was Willie. Sure was. If I'm not mistaken. Okay. I think Jukebox may wrote the original. Yeah, because I always it was always weird like with around that time also the controversy album, but they were like Man, well, was con man controversy oh, needs oh. to be rated, man. It hard. need to be fucking, that's my favorite. Really? For real. That's like, that's album. one of my favorite fucking and albums album ever. And cover, too. I was like, what is this dude doing? <laughs> yeah, he did that shit with them overalls, though. <laughs> yeah, he had the Klansman on there, the overall. Yeah, the all chick, of, yeah. the horse. Yeah, it was all Yeah, he's a damn fool. Willie's a fool, man. That was a fun, that's a funny ass dude, bro. Yeah. For real. Yeah. Man. He, his whole attitude and demeanor was like so hilarious, but so gangster at the same time. His whole demeanor and attitude today is so hilarious and so gangster and so fuck it. Mm -hmm. You know, like Willie same D is like, same, like fuck it. Dude. Like, <laughs> he's like, dude. fuck it. He don't give a fuck. Willie, I ain't doing this and I'll fuck it. Right. <laughs>